Well, good evening, everyone. It's uh, good to be uh, looking in the Word of God again tonight. We thank God for that and for all of you who join us uh, here as well as by video. Thank you for being a part of our study on the fifth chapter of the book of Matthew that we've been uh, working on uh, toward the end of it. And uh, tonight we're going to be looking at Matthew 5, uh, verse number 27 through 28. Probably one of the most controversial parts of uh, the teachings that Jesus gave because it does concern uh, male-female relationships, marriage, uh, those kind of things that sometimes do cause us uh, to have some questions. So hopefully as we look through the Word of God tonight, we'll be able to uh, share some things that might set you free if you've been under that kind of bondage uh, because Jesus did not come to bring bondage. He came to bring freedom. Uh, whom the Son has set free is free indeed, the Scripture said. So he came, he came to bring freedom. So if you're in bondage and you're fearful, you need to seek the face of God because he has the answer. So before we get into the Scripture tonight, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of looking into the divine Word of God. We thank you for your Word and your instruction that you've loved us so much. You gave us clarity to understand. And I pray, O oh God, that every person who hears the teaching tonight will understand the freedom that is in Christ, not the freedom to sin, but the freedom from the powers of sin that you provided for us on the cross. And we look to you for that, and we give you praise and honor for this privilege in Jesus' name, amen. So in Matthew chapter 27, we're gonna begin reading at verse number, uh, pardon me, yeah, 27. We're gonna begin reading and read verse 27 and 28. It says, ye have heard that it was said of the, by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her, hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. This passage uh, is, a, is something that people really do have a hard time understanding because it looks like uh, if you just take it at face value and just say, well, I'm going to look at it from a fleshly point of view, uh, that I've got to wear blinders all the time and not look at anybody. But that's not what the scripture is talking about. It's talking about a heart issue. It's really a heart issue. Uh, uh, someone can look at someone of the opposite sex, and it really doesn't mean anything. They're just, they're just got their eyes open. You know, they're just looking around. They may even see a woman or a woman might see a man who's nice looking and might feel that, that's a nice looking man, that's a nice looking woman. Those kind of things certainly should not bring you into bondage because God created us uh, always to be attracted to the opposite sex. That's what God's plan was. So when we see someone who looks nice, it doesn't mean that we are sinning by thinking that they look nice. So what Jesus is doing in the fifth chapter of Matthew is to take the uh, Old Testament, the uh, Ten Commandments and the way it was given to them in the Old Testament and the way that people have uh, translated it into their own way of thinking instead of really following the heart of God because God has never changed. The Old Testament God, the New Testament God are all the same. They, 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 it is the same, or not they, excuse me, it is the same God in the Old Testament and the New Testament as well. So. When, when we look at this, we need to understand that God has always been the same and God has always been a compassionate and loving God. Had he not been, he would have gotten rid of people uh, a whole lot in the Old Testament, but he bore long and long suffering so many times. So he's saying, in the old time, it was said of them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. But he's saying this is a heart issue. It's not just an act of committing adultery. But he, this is a heart issue when he says that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust, see lust comes from the heart. To lust after her, uh, he's committed adultery, adultery with her already in his heart. So we are taught here there is such a thing as heart adultery, adulterous thoughts and dispositions which are never uh, proceed to the act of actual fleshly adultery are to fleshly fornication, but they actually uh, is, an, is a thing, an event that happens in the heart, a sin that takes place in the heart that does not necessarily have to be carried out. 
There's a passage in 2 Peter chapter 2 I want to share with you tonight. It says, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, 14 and 15. Having eyes full of adultery, of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin. These are people that, that Peter is talking about here. Beguiling unstable souls, a heart that has exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and have gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bezor, or Bozor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Here we see what uh, the heart issue that Jesus was talking about in this passage. He's saying these are people who have all of these terrible issues in their heart that they have not dealt with, that they're operating by, they're causing their, the, uh, the heart is leading their body into sin, the heart is continually craving after things that are going to take a person, this fleshly body, into sin because it begins in the heart. And we know the pathways to the heart are the eyes and the ears uh, that hear and that see things that they should not uh, be partaking of and begin to crave after those things. So those have to be dealt with uh, in, in a prayerful consideration that Jesus Christ came to change the desires of our heart. So our heart has to be turned away from these things. And when you sense that that is a pull in your life, then you, you're going to have to get a hold of God, cry out to God, just like you would with any other kind of sin. You know, nobody has to tell you that you're pulled in a wrong direction, looking at people in an improper way sexually minded that is causing you to go into sin by action but you've already sinned in your heart by even having those kinds of attitudes and looking around in that sense of the word so we seek the face of god and we look to what jesus christ did for us on the cross and we just say lord this is a sin in my life i am not looking at the opposite sex in the correct way it's not just men. Jesus deals with the fact that a man looking upon a woman, but I realize it can be on either side. And we look to that and we say, God, I have this sin in my life. My heart is not right. I am sinning in my heart. I'm committing adultery in my heart, even though I'm not carrying it out. So here we see that adultery can be done by, by actually flirtatious ways of behaving around women or men, women or men, uh, trying to influence them sexually or draw them to you sexually. These are uh, real sins of the heart that must be dealt with in the life of a Christian. And I must repent. The first step is to acknowledge I am wrong. I can't justify it and say, oh, it's okay, it doesn't matter. I'm not really committing anything, I'm just looking. Well, then we have this word of Jesus that says something in your heart is causing you to want to look improperly at the opposite sex. So therefore, I must repent in the first place, agree with the word of God, which says that is a sin. I must repent of that sin, and then I must cry out to the Lord to say, God, I can't fix this. It's got a stronghold in my life, but I'm looking to that finished work of the cross where you purchased the provision for me to be to be powerful over these things that are sinful to try to draw me away from you. So I lay hold of that benefit of the cross today and I ask in Jesus' name that you will break this thing and change the desires of my heart. And I can tell you as one who knows, any kind of thing in your heart that is displeasing to the Lord, God will begin to change your desires. And you'd be amazed at how uh, quickly, God can do this when we truly confess and don't try to defend ourselves and let God do what he actually wants to do. So this command forbids not only the acts of fornication and adultery, but all appetites to them, uh, all lusting after the forbidden object. That is the beginning of the sin, lust conceiving as a bad step towards the sin and where the lust is, dwe is dwelt upon and approved. So in my heart, I can justify and approve this lust, even though the scripture says that it's wrong. I must go with the scripture and not with what I'm feeling or thinking or somebody's told me. James 1 and 15 says, 
Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. You know, there were so many people in the scripture that uh, give us the example. One of the greatest, most outstanding passages is the one concerning David. Uh, when he looked out on the porch, out of his, uh, his uh, palace and saw uh, uh, the woman Bathsheba be bathing on the, on the top of her house. It was not inappropriate what she was doing, but he looked upon her and sin started, the lust started developing in his heart and it went on until it produced eventually. We know he went through the terrible death of that son who was born out of his sin. So David is an example of how that sin works. Samson, of course, is a great example of how someone who was led away from God by all of the women that he became attracted to and looked at improperly. Of course, Potiphar's wife, who tried to entice Joseph to sin with her. These are examples of how these things produce bad things. They produce death. They produce problems that lead to death. All of these things are true. You know, Job said this, and it's such a good uh, passage of scripture in, in Job chapter 31, verse one. He says, I have made a covenant with mine eyes. And why then should I think upon a maid? He said, I made a covenant with my eyes. I am not by the grace of God. And of course, Job knew nothing about the grace of God. He knew God, but as far as the provision that Christ made for us on the cross, the Old Testament saints had no true understanding of the provision that was available or would be available to them. Many of them reached forward and grabbed grace just like David did uh, and got a hold of the provision of God out of his great love and service to God. But technically, the Old Testament people didn't have the fullness of what we have today. But we, as a child of God, can make a covenant with our eyes. We can say, Lord, watch over my eyes. Help my eyes not to look in places they shouldn't look. Help me to shut off the computer. Give me the grace to shut off the computer. If I can't get on there and, and do the right thing, then Lord, just take these things, these tools that we have available today that will lead us into this sin I know when I'm putting my eyes on something they should not be on and that I can quickly uh, make that decision to say, Lord, I, I'm not going down that road by your grace and your enabling power. I believe that you can take this desire out of my heart that I won't have to deal with it anymore. And I can tell you that that's the way the Lord works because we're not supposed to go through life miserably trying not to do what we really want to do if we understand the provision Christ made for us on the cross. Okay, let's go on from there in verse number 29 of Matthew chapter 5. And Jesus is saying this here. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one, that one of thy members should perish, not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee. For it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Wow, that's a, that's a powerful statement right there. Giving us the real urgency to understand uh, the, that these things, no matter how awful it might be to think about getting, to pulling an eye out or cutting off a hand, would be absolutely horrible to think about. But it's more horrible, way beyond how horrible that is, it's way more horrible to be cast into hell. So I'd be better off without anything in my life that would, that's causing me to go into sin. So, so uh, the, such looks and indulgences are so very dangerous and destructive to the soul that it is better to lose the eye and the hand than thus to offend than to give way to sin and perish eternally in it. That's what this lesson is teaching us here that Jesus taught the people that he was speaking to then. It is better, nothing is worth losing your soul. Nothing is worth losing your soul. There's not a relationship, there's not a thing, an object, a possession, an activity, an addiction, Whatever it is in our lives that lead us in the wrong path, there is absolutely nothing more important 
than going to heaven and avoiding the horribleness of dying and going to an eternal fire of hell, which the Bible clearly tells us that that's what hell is, a place of burning fire where the person never dies and will be continually tormented throughout the ages of time. I don't understand all about it, but I do know enough about the scripture that I can tell you that it is not going to be a party time. It's not gonna be a visit with friends time. It's going to be a horrible, agonizing time that will never end. Uh, and in the meantime, we have this great place called heaven that all who go there, who have allowed God to do the work when we die to the flesh and the desires of the flesh, lay it all on the altar, give it all up to Jesus, surrender everything, I can tell you that the eternal joy of being in heaven is gonna so override all of those things that there is nothing worth going to hell over. I want you to remember that as we go forward with this lesson. The next part of the lesson is verse number 31 and 32, and this is what Jesus is saying. It has been said, whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. So this is what has been taught. And in Moses' time, they asked for this. They said, how can we divorce a wife? And there was given them in that time a writing of divorcement. Needless to say, it, became, it be, began to be abused, that right, and many times there was divorce for no reason at all, just, you know, like they say, trying on a new pair of shoes, I don't like those, let me swap out here. It became very easy and, and uh, okay just to, for a man, just to decide to get rid of a woman. But look what Jesus says, in verse 32, Jesus says, but I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife saving for the cause of fornication causeth her to commit adultery and whosoever shall marry her that is divorced committeth adultery so here we're saying jesus said it is not a good thing god hates divorce and it should never be entered into just for lightly reasons it it is always caused by the hardness of somebody's heart Divorce is always caused. Now it may uh, manifest itself in somebody committing adultery or somebody just running off and leaving, uh, deserting their family. Uh, it may end up being that way, but it starts in the heart. And when the heart refuses to follow the will of God, there is a hardness that starts taking place. And every time the Holy Spirit starts to try to convict that person, and they harden their heart against that voice of the Holy Spirit, the heart gets harder and harder and harder. And pretty soon, in any marriage, at least one person had a heart that was so hard that they would not listen to what the scripture was saying and what was the right thing to do. In verse number 33, it says, again, you have heard that it hath been said of them of old time, thou shalt not forswear thyself, but shall perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And I'm gonna finish this reading, then we're gonna go back to the divorce thing. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because thou canst not make one hair white or black, but let your communication be, yea, yea, nay, nay, for whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. When we say a yea and we say a nay, but we put attachments to it. Jesus is saying our word, sort of like we say these days, is our bond. If you can't trust my word, you know what? You can't trust me at all. So many times I have stood at the altar, I've performed marriage ceremonies and I've stood there watching this couple. Many times in counseling, I have told them the, the, uh, the areas that I feel like are their problem. There could be problems about these things, things that no one else knew about, but that they confessed to me sitting in my office, this, this, this. I have given counsel and said to them, um, you know, I, I, I've even dis, uh, disadvised or given advice against someone marrying someone else. Uh, when I really felt led and the Holy Spirit was dealing with me about 
this union that was about to take place. And I can tell you without a single time, there has always come a time when those relationships ended up in divorce. Every one of them that I can remember that I sat with them and tried to talk them out of this marriage, they went ahead with it. And as they stood before me or my husband or someone saying those marriage vows, I heard them say all those things, and for better, for worse, and sickness and health, all of those things, I will cling to no one but you as long as we both shall live, and that quick I do, I do. And you know that I do does not ever mean I do unless it's difficult. Because I'm gonna tell you from one who's been married almost 60 years, every marriage has some difficulties. There is not a single relationship anywhere in the world that doesn't have some relationships, especially right after you're married and for a period of time, you know, they say the honeymoon time, and then there comes a time when reality sets in and you see the things about this person you didn't know before, there is always difficulties. So I always pray, God help us to, as we make these promises at the altar, to take them very deeply and very seriously. It is not a joke. This is a vow made before God. So uh, we need to understand that, that we, not, we are not to take it lightly and just jump into a divorce because you're not comfortable, because you have a little situation with this person or that person or the other person. Uh, We've got, to, we've got to make it more serious than that because God makes it more serious than that. Now, does it mean that divorce is the unpardonable sin? No, it doesn't. Thank God. Some of you got married years ago. You just didn't like the other person. They didn't like you. Something came up, and for some flippant reason, you got a divorce, and you're married again. You've been married for 40 years to somebody, and I do not intend at all to bring condemnation on you. Even if it was your fault, even if you were young and, and didn't have a clue, you weren't even a Christian, it doesn't really matter. Or if you were a Christian and you just made a foolish decision, I'm here to tell you today, God forgives that sin too. You know, when I was growing up uh, in a certain denomination, it was like this was the unpardonable sin. If somebody got married and got remarried, it was like the unpardonable sin because they're committing adultery. Thank God, all sin is forgiven by God. There's, not, there's only one reference. It has nothing to do with divorce in the Bible that deals with that subject. So it has nothing to do with this. Uh, you know, I've made things in my life. I've had to repent and ask God to forgive me. I'm so glad he doesn't keep on holding that against me. No, every sin that we come to and repent before God means that you can be forgiven. There are reasons for divorce certainly for fornication. Uh, for If a man doesn't provide for his own, the Bible says he's worse than an infidel, infidel he's denied the faith, uh, he's rejected his family, and anybody who leaves, an unbeliever leaves and deserts in a marriage, those are all reasons why God even gives permission for marriage. So there are certainly reasons that, that are not sin. There are reasons that are not sin. I've dealt with people whose spouse held a gun on them held a gun on their head, and I said, you gotta get out of that situation. You don't just stay there because you feel like you need to stay in that marriage. I do say that no matter what kind of divorce you're dealing with, the saddest part of it all, and you know it, is that children are always hurt. It doesn't matter what, what kind of, and I'm talking about older children, the little babies, of course, they usually don't even know if you get a, get a good marriage after that bad thing that happened to you, they usually call that person their parent and they don't even really understand. But as they get a little older and they get connected to that, the, your spouse, whichever one it was that uh, caused the problem or whatever, they don't ever understand. They always hurt uh, in, the, in the situation of a marriage that, is, that ends with children involved. I know that. The only thing you can do in that case is to keep a right attitude toward their dad or their mom that's not living with them anymore all the time because it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to try to, it doesn't help, pardon me, it doesn't help that child to, uh, to keep on being uh, that person berated in their eyes all the time. You let them grow up and if there's something bad enough there, you won't have to tell them. They'll begin to understand the difficulty in that situation. But what I do want you to understand before we close out this teaching tonight, beyond anything else, is that no matter what you had in your past, 
The devil does want to hold something over your head. He wants you to feel guilty. He wants you to give up. He wants you to quit. And, and many times he will use the Bible just like he did on Jesus. You know, that's what he did on Jesus. He pulled scriptures and said, thus saith God, thus saith God. The devil knows what thus saith God. And he will try his best to beat you over the head. And there can even be other people. There are people that call themselves Christians, and maybe they are, I don't know, I'm not their judge, who will honestly beat you over the head over divorce and remarriage. This passage here that talks about causing a woman to commit adultery if her husband divorces her, no woman in Bible times could have lived as a divorced wife. Every woman in those days had to have a husband in order to survive. And so consequently, she would eventually commit adultery, technically, uh, as the scripture says here, to remarry just to be able to survive if she had been divorced and forsaken by her husband. So all of these things that the devil wants to bring on you to beat you up is his job. That's what he does. He tries to beat people up over this problem. You know, divorce is so much more rampant than it used to be. When I was a child, you know, most of my friends, their mom and dad lived together in the house. They had their biological parents, most of them, that I knew. But now these days, I'm telling you, it's almost getting to where it's, it's the minority of children in classrooms and in Sunday school classes that are actually living in a situation where they have both parents living in the home. You know what? We serve a God that's big enough to deal with all that. If we put him first, truly put Jesus first, I believe God will bless you past that. And somehow by the grace of God, you can even help your children. If you have wisdom from the Holy Spirit and it has to happen to you and you didn't want it to happen and you did no great sin to cause it to happen, I'm telling you, I believe that it is not impossible for God to give you the wisdom above everything in the world to be able to guide those children to the, to the best of your equipped ability through the grace of God to help them grow and become strong young people who serve God after they grow older, no matter what kind of influence there was in their life previously. God is able to do it. Don't ever limit God. Don't ever limit him by unbelief or the lack of faith saying none of these things are gonna happen because I made a mistake. You know, God can work in spite of our mistakes or else you know what? He is not a very big God, but I serve a big God. He's a mighty, wonderful, awesome God. And he is able to do anything far beyond anything you could even think. So don't let the devil beat you up over this. Those of you who are married and you're considering divorce, I would just say do all you can to avoid it. Put your whole life into it to say, God, I, I want this marriage to work. I want there to be healing. I want there to be restoration. Do all you can, but there may come a time that you have to make that decision or it may be taken out of your hand. Your the spouse may say, I'm leaving. You know what? There's not a thing in the world you can do, but don't let that become so strong in your life after it's happened that you let your life be destroyed because you are hanging on to some kind of condemnation that either the devil is bringing into your life or that, that you feel like God is causing to happen, which isn't true. But sometimes God's people can even do that to draw you into condemnation. Jesus didn't come to condemn you. He came to bring you life and freedom and consolation. Take your rest in Jesus. Read through this passage. Let the Holy Spirit speak to you the things that I've been saying concerning them. And I believe with all my heart that we can stand in a place where God can give us peace in the midst of every situation we face in life. He is a good God. This last verse in, the, in this passage here deals with swearing not at all. And uh, maybe it would deal with some sometimes court and legal actions. Uh, so technically, I know there are times when we have to make a pledge or swear. There are some people who won't, who won't swear in court. That's a conviction they have because of this passage. Hey, that's fine. I understand that. But 
there's nothing wrong with making promises and pledges to things. This is talking about swearing by things that don't even belong to you. You can't swear by God's throne or by the earth or by the footstool, uh, by his footstool, neither in Jerusalem. You can't, you can't swear by these things. They are not yours. But you can make a pledge every time you get a loan for a house or a car. That's a promise. That's a pledge. Uh, when you, any time you make any kind of commitment, that's a pledge. And there's nothing wrong with those things. And honestly, I don't think there's anything wrong with, with making a, a swearing in, in a courtroom as long as you're not swearing against those things that God says not to, not to. And, and many courtrooms nowadays, you wouldn't even have to put your hand on a Bible if you felt condemned about that. Just go with your heart about those kind of things, but know that Jesus here is telling you not to swear by these things that only belong to God. They do not belong to you. And make a promise, and if you make a promise, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Let it be solid, because I can tell you right now that God is giving you an order never to tell a lie. Don't tell something that appears to be a lie after it's all said and done. Don't let people say, well, you just never know. Just because they said it don't mean they'll do it. That's not to be a true child of God. A true child of God, people can depend on our word. And you know, I'm so glad that we have a God that I can depend on his word. Every single word he said to me is truth. Because, you know, truth is a person, and his name is Jesus. And no matter what he has said, he will never alter the words that came out of his mouth. If the whole world fell apart, the word of God will stand eternally and sure, for sure, forever. So hang on to the word of God. Don't compromise the word of God, because he is a faithful God, a loving God, and a good God, and he will lead us into all truth. Amen. Praise God. God bless you all for being a part of this study tonight. I pray that it has been a blessing to you uh, and through the rest of all of the teaching of Matthew chapter 5. We appreciate you being a part of it and God bless you. <laughs>